What's up and welcome to another episode of Gizmo Slip Tech. Today we're taking a look at the Evoc P960EN or another name for it would be the Clevo P960. You'll see the same exact laptop on a bunch of different resellers. Now the cool new thing about this laptop is that it is a 16.1 inch display. Before this laptop, 16.1 inch displays weren't really a thing. You had 15.4 inch laptops and then you had 17.3 inch laptops. Well this new 16.1 inch laptop display size is a nice middle ground, especially since it's got this new minimal bezel design. This thing will probably fit a lot of people's ideal laptop size and weight. Now the other big thing is that this thing costs about $600 less than most of the competition. So the Razer Blade 15 Advance and the GS65 Stealth, those ones run about $3,000 if you want the RTX 2080 Max-Q versions. This RTX 2080 Max-Q version only costs about $2,400 if you want a similar spec machine. There are also some other advantages and pros and cons. We're gonna go over all of those. We're also gonna be testing the temperatures and the performance of this machine in depth in today's review. Now I gotta give a big shout out to HID Evolution that sent over this laptop. They also performed some cooling upgrades. They added basically liquid metal or thermal grizzly crown knot. Now they also upgraded the panel to make it have less backlight bleed and they also added thermal pads to places like the SSD to make sure that nothing overheats. The main thing to keep in mind is that if you don't buy from HID Evolution you might get slightly worse temperatures on the CPU and GPU whenever we get to the temperature section of this review. Anyway, I'll have links in the video description down below if you want to purchase this laptop. If you go straight from HID Evolution's website, I don't get any affiliate sales from that. This is not a sponsored video. But if you do decide to buy it from Amazon, uh, that does go to help support the channel. So big thank you to them for sending me this laptop for review. Without further ado, let's dive into the technical specs on this machine. This thing features an i7-8750H, an RTX 2080 Max-Q variant with a 144 hertz display with about 100% sRGB display, 16 gigs of RAM, a 256 gig SSD plus a one terabyte HDD, and to top it off, it has a second PCIe SSD M.2 slot so you can fit in another third storage slot option, which is really, really good. spec just like this, this laptop costs about $2,400. Coming from the factory, this thing only weighs 4.6 pounds. When we weighed it here at the house though, it actually weighed a little bit over five pounds. So like five pounds, 0.9 ounces. So basically 5.08 pounds, something like that. Uh, and that makes sense because we added an SSD and there's also a one terabyte HDD. If you don't have the one terabyte HDD, it probably would weigh about 4.6 pounds. And to top it off, this thing's only 0.78 inches thick. The important thing to gather here is that this is an exceptionally thin, exceptionally light laptop and a very, very competitively price laptop as well. There are different model versions of this laptop. You can get an RTX 2060 non-Max-Q version. That's probably your best bang for the buck version of this. Now that RTX 2060 version can vary in price all the way from $1,400 up to $1,600 depending on how you configure it and which reseller you buy it from. Now for ports on the left side, we have a USB type A, two USB type C's that are sadly not Thunderbolt 3 enabled. Then we have a mini display port, an HDMI and a power port. And of course we have a big left hand exhaust. And then on the back we have two large exhausts with no ports. On the right side we have a headphone port, a mic port, a USB type A, a full size SD card reader, a ethernet port, as well as a Kensington lock port. That's all the breakdown on the basics. How does this thing actually perform? Let's get into it, here we go. Taking a look at the benchmarks here for Apex Legends, we had 126 frame rate average. Now the blue bars on the far right, the full extension bars, that is the average. The orange bar indicates the minimum 1% FPS. If the 1% FPS is too low, you'll have noticeable stuttering in the gameplay. It just won't be as smooth and as fluid. So taking a closer look at these actual frame rate numbers, you can see that Apex Legends, Fortnite, all average really, really close to that 144 hertz FPS that we're shooting for on this laptop, but PUBG, Far Cry 5, and Witcher 3 are not quite hitting as high of numbers. So taking a closer look at the Apex Legends benchmarks, you can see that in the training grounds, we're getting our best overall FPS, and that is simply because we don't have other players on the map uh, bottlenecking our FPS, and it's just a lot less complex area. So 
a more realistic uh, representation of the FPS is at Skulltown, and you can see at high settings we average 94 FPS, which is is good. It's it's fluid gameplay, and our minimum 1% FPS is not very low at 73, so it's still fluid. But in the ideal world, we're trying to get that 144 frames per second. So knocking our settings down to the lowest possible settings, we average 134, which is a lot better and is very close to the ideal FPS that you're shooting for. Taking a look at the bridges low. We also averaged 150 FPS. So now we're actually above the 144 FPS goal. And when I was playing Apex Legends, I at many points in the map, I was averaging well above 144 FPS. And in other areas like Skulltown, I was averaging closer to like, you know, 100, 120. So this laptop can play Apex Legends very, very well, but just not quite ideally. I'd love to see those averages be about 20 frames per second higher. Uh, and then we'd be hitting those, those ideal above 144 FPS averages and more locations. Taking a look at Fortnite, the Dusty Divot run on Epic, we had 134. So you can see when we set the settings to Epic, we're averaging just under the 144 frames per second mark. But when we set them to a mixture of low and Epic, we're hitting close to 200 FPS averages. So if I was playing Fortnite on this laptop, I would set it to a mixture of low and Epic, and you're gonna have exceptionally good performance on this laptop. Taking a closer look at PlayerUnknown Battlegrounds, we're gonna go ahead and compare this with a number of laptops. Taking a look at the Gigabyte Aero 15X9, you can see that we only average 75 FPS when we hit 110 in the exact same test. And there's really two main reasons for that. Uh, this is a CPU bottleneck game a lot, and I believe we only had single channel memory in the Aero 15. And then we also have a lot more throttling uh, happening in the Aero 15. But notice how good the performance is on this Evoc P960EN. And this is, of course, is also because we have a 2080 Max-Q versus a 2070 Max-Q. That also factors in here as well. Another really important thing to point out is that this laptop actually matched the performance of the GE75 Raider in PUBG at 110 FPS, even though the GE75 Raider has a full non-Max-Q version of the RTX 2080. Now, of course, that's not gonna be true in non-CPU bound games, so keep that in mind. Moving on to Far Cry 5. Again, we have a lot better performance from the Evoc P960 at 98 FPS. The GE75 Raider did 103, while the Aero 15 X9 only did 68. You're getting overall solid performance for a laptop of this size. So I think that's the main thing we're keeping in mind here is that the CPU is performing solidly in these games. It's not really throttling much, if at all. And that is leading to some really good numbers from a thin and light machine. Now, one thing I do wanna point out is that the Asus ROG G703GX, which is a laptop that weighs like 10 pounds, by the way, uh, it did average 115 FPS, and that's a pretty big jump. And that really shows the difference between a thin and light laptop and a thicker laptop. Taking a closer look at the Witcher 3, we've got 82 frames per second from the Evoc P960, and that's, that's good, that's great for gameplay, but when you compare that with some of these other laptops, we're getting 119 FPS in the MSI GE75 Raider. Just know that there is a massive difference in performance in some games from a GE75 Raider, which is a laptop that is just a little bit thicker and weighs one pound more, and it averaged ridiculously better frame rates in this particular title. And that's because it is not a CPU bound game, it is a GPU bound game. Taking a closer look at the Fortnite Dusty Divot test, you can see that the P960 does quite well, even better than the GE75 Raider, and that is because it has a lot better CPU. And the big thing to note here is that the Aero 15 really struggles putting out high frame rate numbers in Fortnite. I mean, 123 FPS average is still really good, but it's not 233 FPS average that you're getting from the P960. And that is primarily because of the CPU bottlenecking you're getting from a single channel memory again. So if you do decide to get the Aero 15, be sure to get dual channel memory. And I would recommend repasting the CPU. So hopefully you get a little bit better uh, temperature and performance from the Aero 15 as it was struggling a little bit in my tests. Taking a closer look at 3D Mark Firestrike Ultra, we managed to get 44 66 from the P960, and that is good, but you can see that the GE75 Raider really outclasses the P960 in this test, and that's because this is like, like pretty much a pure 
pure graphics test, no CPU bottlenecking involved, and so you're gonna get a lot better performance from just a more powerful GPU. Speaking of CPU performance, let's take a look at the Cinebench R15 multi-score. So uh, at stock settings, we, the highest score we got was 1121, and the throttled average was 1006. These are not terrible numbers, they're not great numbers either. Now when I did undervolt it, I got dramatically better performance at 1222, which is, is really good. That's the, the ideal perfect Cinebench score. And, and then after we did a number of tests in a row, we got a good idea of what the throttled Cinebench score would be, and that was 1173, uh, which is still really good. It's about like 95% of the ideal score but it's, it's not quite perfect, and that is because we ran into current limit throttling, and this might be able to be overcome by a more aggressive undervolt, but whenever I do my performance tests, I have a standard minus 100 millivolt undervolt for all the laptops to have an even keel, but I, I probably could have undervolted this more, and probably could have gotten a 1200 Cinebench score consistently, even when throttling. Really good overall CPU performance, as you can see uh, when we compare to some of these other laptops. The GE75 Raider only got a 1038 of throttled score even when undervolted. So this is performing about 140 points better than the GE75 Raider, which is a thicker, bigger laptop. So really, really impressive CPU performance here. You can see with the Razer Blade 15 throttled score only average 970, which is really not that great of CPU performance. So that means that this machine is like so close to perfect CPU performance for the 8750H, but it's just not quite there. I think a more aggressive undervolt would be perfect for it and really pull out the maximum performance. Last but not least, we have the Adobe 4K render time. With coming in at seven minutes and 19 seconds, this machine kind of blew my mind. It did better than a lot of other machines, even my Aorus X7 with the 8850H. This is the exact same Adobe project, the exact same render timeline, the exact same uh, file being rendered. So I'm, I'm kind of blown away. This thing even beat the Asus ROG G703GX that has a much more powerful processor. So very interesting result. I don't know the specifics of why it performed dramatically better. There's got to be some hardware thing with Adobe Premiere, but this is a real life test and I want to throw it in there. Just know that this thing renders videos in Adobe Premiere really, really well. Okay, let's talk temperatures. This thing actually does extremely good with temps, especially when the maximum fans are on. With maximum fans enabled, the GPU only reached 65 degrees on average and the CPU reached 75 degrees on average. Those are exceptionally good temperatures, but when you have the fans on maximum, it does get a little bit loud. We did some noise testing. We averaged about 56 decibels with the fans on maximum. Now, when we switched the fans to the silent mode, or let's say basically much quieter mode, it's not quite silent, that's a pretty big difference in ambient room noise. Now, when we switched to the silent fan mode, we had a 10 degree bump in temps from 65 to 75 on the GPU and from 75 to 85 on the CPU on average. And that is like right on the borderline of having minor CPU throttling. So if you're okay with the CPU being minorly throttled here and there, you're going to have really good overall performance still, but have a dramatically quieter machine when you run it on silent mode. The only downside with the temps is that the left wrist rest does get a bit warm when under a heavy load. Now it's not uncomfortable to play for an extended gaming session if you're in an air conditioned environment, but if you're in a warmer room, you don't have air conditioning or you're going to be in outdoors environments, I would not really recommend this for uh, extended gaming sessions because it's gonna get uncomfortable having that left wrist be so warm. You could also obviously use an external keyboard and mouse and then it won't really be a problem anyway. The display on this laptop is your standard 144 hertz 100% sRGB display. Because of the high refresh rate, playing games on this machine was fantastic. I, I felt like I had a competitive edge and a competitive advantage against other gamers. Uh, there was minimal ghosting and the screen feels very responsive and very comfortable to play on. And I will also note that because this has the back light bleed reduction option checked on HID Evolution's website. It does have very good contrast and dark levels when you're in darker environments and with darker scenes. So if you're someone who really cares about that and don't like backlight bleed, be sure to check that box if you decide to buy this laptop. Now, the keyboard in this machine is very good. It does feel very good, very tactile, deep travel, and it has kind of a shunk 
feel to it. So I do like this keyboard a lot. Now the backlight is not especially bright as you can tell from here. It's, it's not like super bright like the GE75 Raider, but at nighttime it does pop and it does look really good. Now there are a number of customizable options for the backlight. You can set different zones. There's like three zones, a left, right, and middle, and you can set the different colors. There's different patterns. They're not really amazing. And another thing to note is that the software seems a little bit janky with the backlight on the keyboard. I had to open the keyboard software sometimes to get the keyboard backlight to come on when I booted the laptop. So know that uh, they're, they're still working out the software and drivers a little bit on this laptop. This does have the latest drivers. So, I mean, it's a brand new laptop. They'll probably fix them in an update, uh, but just, just know that that is happening with this machine. Now the touchpad on this laptop is a solid touchpad, no complaints really. Uh, it has semi deep travel mouse buttons left and right. And the, the touchpad itself is very smooth and very, very responsive. Overall battery life on this laptop is solid. It does have a fairly small battery though, only at 62 watt hours, a little bit smaller than what you would get in some of the competition. Now under extremely light load, you're probably looking at about seven hours of usage. Under medium loads, for example, watching Netflix or YouTube, you're looking at about four to four and a half, maybe five hours of usage and then of course under heavy load such as gaming or rendering video you're looking at about an hour to an hour and a half of usage depending on what you're doing so overall decent battery life but you are going to get a little bit better battery life if you go with something like the razor blade 15. now opening this laptop with one hand is not a problem uh, the only downside is that the hinges are a bit loose which results that if you tap the display there's a little bit of wobble there so i'm imagining if you're in a car ride the screen's going to be wobbling a little bit now the speakers on this machine are good for a thin and light laptop, but don't expect too much. They don't get especially loud and they don't have especially good clarity and they don't have a lot of bass. It's just, it, it's going to work well for watching a YouTube video or watching a movie. Uh, it's just not going to be fantastic for those things though. So what are the downsides of this laptop? Well, first of all, this wrist rest does get warm and for some of you, that might be a big deal breaker. The second downside is that chassis is just not going to be as rigid as the all aluminum unibody chassis of like a Razer Blade 15 or the fairly rigid GS65 Stealth. Now, don't get me wrong, this thing is well built. There's like no torquing in this thing at all. Overall, it's a primarily metal chassis, but it's just not gonna be the same level of build quality. But why should you buy this laptop? Well, this unit features extremely high value compared to other thin and light Max-Q systems. First of all, it costs on average about $600 cheaper than a lot of the competition. Second, it features more storage options while still maintaining a very thin and light profile. So you can fit up to two M.2 SSDs and one two and a half inch hard drive slot. That is incredible amount of versatility for a thin and light laptop. The third reason is that it gives the users more control over the CPU than most other ultra portables. On the GS65 Stealth and on the Razer Blade 15 and on the Aero 15, I struggled to raise the power limits on the CPU or to undervolt them properly. Sometimes you just, the undervolt doesn't even take. Uh, and yet this one gives you full manual control over your power limits and your undervolting. So if you wanna raise the power limit to get even better performance, you can do that. If you wanna increase the undervolt, you can do that as well. We had exceptionally good temperatures on this machine. I think only 65 degrees on a GPU and 75 degrees on the CPU. That is fantastic. Should you buy this laptop? Absolutely, freaking lootly if you're in the market for a powerhouse under five pound machine. It's a great option, I think, especially if you get the cooling upgrades from HID Evolution. Again, links in the description. Thanks so much for watching, guys. If you enjoyed this review and you want to see more, be sure to hit that subscribe button and tap that like button. We'll see you guys in the next one. Brandon, out.